I'll take this opportunity to welcome our extremely experienced panelists. Mr. Vikas Singh, a voracious reader and self-confessed word addict, he obtained an honors degree in history from Stay and Stephens College and a postgraduate diploma in marketing management. Starting his career with the Economic Times, he is now the resident editor of Times of India New Delhi. He has previously co-authored several successful books and The Big Fix is his first novel, though definitely not his last. Mr. Hakimuddin Habibullah, he is the co-founder and principal consultant at Winning Matters Consulting Private Limited. He is an Olympian swimmer with over 20 years of experience and an engineer who has previously worked with Tata Consultancy Services. He has returned to Indian sports in 2006. He has also been a part of FIKI's sports committee since 2010. He believes in the power of sports towards enabling socio-economic development and envisions an India where sporting excellence and participation are an in integral part of Indian culture. Ms. Reeth Abraham, a national champion in long jump and heplathon, she won, she won the Anjana Award in 1997. During the course of her long athletic career spanning over 15 years, she has represented Karnataka State and India on a number of occasions, setting records along the way. Her best achievement was as a mother when she won a national championship within 10 months of giving birth. She's also the first Indian mother to break a national record and the, in the South Asian Games record. She also holds to her credit being the first Asian woman to win an Asian medal in an individual event as a mother. She is truly an inspiration. Our moderator for this session is Mr. Borya Majumdar, a Rhodes Scholar. He is the author of a number of best-selling works on Indian sports, like 22 Yards to Freedom, A Social History of Indian Cricket, Olympics, The India Story with Nalin Mehta, Cellotape Legacy, Delhi and the Commonwealth Games with Nalin Mehta. His new book is called Cooking in, on the Run, An Average Indian Man's Encounters with Food. But before we start this session, we are very happy to launch The Big Fix by Mr. Vikas Singh. The book is a murder mystery wrapped in the cricketing paradigm, and also the book launch of Cricketing Times by Mr. Borya Majumdar. Please welcome our panelists on the... Can I, can I just request Borya to please unveil the big fix? And my other panelists as well. It's a privilege to be here with them, so I'd, I'd be very grateful if they'd uh, launch the book. Thank you. Can we please have a round of applause? Thank you. You know, when, can you hear me? When Vikram first wanted us to do this panel and said, what should be the topic? And he said, uh, can we do a topic like, is corruption a way of life in Indian sport? I said, yes, we should. But then when I think about it, we've been given one hour. It's 5.21 to be precise. We'll stop at 6.21. Fact is, do you need one hour or do you need one second? Is corruption a way of life in Indian sport? Yes or no? All of us will say yes. Chapter closed. But the fact is, why? That's what we will talk about. But before that, my panelists, you've already been sort of introduced to them. What we are going to talk about is we're going to talk about cricket, which Vikas and I will do bulk of the talking about. And Hakim and Reeth, both very experienced athletes, Indian athletes, national athletes, will talk about the Olympic sporting side. There are two circuses on in India at the same time, at this point in time. One circus is called the BCCI, which is on in Chennai. And the other circus is called the Indian Olympic Association versus the International Olympic Committee. And both of these will never cease to amaze you. Every day you will get something new about them. So the first question to my panelists, and I'll keep coming to you in between with some anecdotes. Because when you write the big fix, you wear two hats. The first hat is that of a journalist who covered the Commonwealth Games front page of the Times of India three consecutive months, 2010, covered the IPL fixing saga. And I must say this, when your paper called Mr. Srinivasan for an interview, the answer was brilliant. He said, I will not give the Times of India an interview. Why? Because I am the only person after Mahatma Gandhi to have been featured on the front page of the Times of India for 12 consecutive days. So what did the IPL fixing scandal in reality influence the big fix? Tell me, wearing both hats, as a journalist and as an author, how do you deal with sports corruption? 
Okay, so uh, I, I hope I'm audible. Yeah. So, uh, you know, first of all, that quote of Mr. Srinivasan about being on the front page 12 times after Mahatma Gandhi, well, all I can say is, uh, you know, he was on the front page for very different reasons than Mahatma Gandhi might have been. And unlike the Mahatma, quite clearly, he doesn't believe in turning the other cheek. Uh, but, uh, you know, also, uh, I think a little before that, a uh, couple of years back, I recall that Mr. Lalit Modi was on the front page a fair number of times. And Mr. Srinivasan didn't have a problem with that. A point I'd like to make clear is that, you know, the TO as an organization doesn't have an agenda against Mr. Srinivasan. Uh, we don't really have an agenda against individuals. Uh, we, we just want to hopefully see clean governance. And, uh, you know, we'll sort of keep doing the stories as and when they keep happening. Beyond that, uh, I do, as you mentioned, wear a different hat as, as a writer. You know, on the one hand, you're a journalist. And you have a certain dharma as a journalist, which is to be fair and impartial and to not run stories uh, until and unless they're confirmed. But equally, you know, as a sort of uh, budding writer, you feel there is so much drama and there is so much potential for some great fiction. So the big fix, I'd say, is, you know, probably 20% of it is known fact that is out there in the public domain. Maybe another 30% is stuff that is, you know, known within say, the fraternity of uh, journalists and, you know, the, the, the cricketers themselves, but has never really come out in public because there's a sort of unspoken omerta between, uh, you know, your source and journalists. And also because you can't really run a story until unless it's confirmed, until unless you're absolutely convinced of its authenticity. But it, it makes for great, uh, you know, it makes for great fiction. And about 50% is uh, imagination. So, yeah, all, you know, that... I'd say that's about the ratio, but uh, as you okay, were telling okay, me... Okay, okay, yeah. 50% is imagination, 50% is reality. Well, I, well, I ask Hakim and Reeth about, you know, their part of the thing. The 50% which is not imagination, you've got to reveal to my audience today, okay? <laughs> Hakim, coming from there, two very sim significant words there, clean governance. Ever possible in Indian Olympic sport? Well, I mean, um, f for me, the starting point is why... I mean, I understand that, you know, sports people are passionate about what they do. But it's, a, it, it's this expectation that we have of sport needs to be clean. But when you look at it, sport is actually got multiple layers to it. The thing that we watch on television is the business of sport. It's hardcore, it's ruthless, it's to win at all costs. And then it's the same laws as the corporate world at play. You know, So as much as they've never been above board, in terms of governance, but things are improving there and sport is clearly at the right place and right time to adopt some of the best practices from there. But, um, you know, the other world that we intersect with is the political world because that's where we've seen a lot of people having an influence into the system. And that's where we see this complex web of the corporate political world that falls into sport. And it's going to be an evolution and there's an opportunity and I believe... Uh, with the work even that we are involved with, that through smart interventions, we would be able to control it, if not completely eliminate it. Reet, to come to you. Uh, Reet, former Arjuna Awardee, 1997, long jumper, very sort of uh, excellent career for, for India as an athlete, now apparently has revolutionized the sporting culture in Bangalore because she started this run which is on every Saturday. Anybody can participate. So it's basically sport for all. And, by the way, birthday girl. So a hand for her, please. Reeti Abraham. Uh, you know, the question to you, Clean Sports India is a movement that you all are part of. But who do you all deal with? And I'll tell you two quick anecdotes before I ask Reeth, how do you deal with people like this? The first anecdote about Suresh Kalmadi. Uh, this was during the Commonwealth Games, one day after the Commonwealth Games opening ceremony. One day. I met him in the morning. And if you remember his opening ceremony speech, he said Prince Charles and Princess Diana. And everybody started saying ghost, ghost, ghost in the audience. The second thing that he said, he said President Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad. And everyone in that stadium started laughing. Okay? So next morning when I meet him, I said, how could you say Prince Charles and Princess Diana? And how could you say Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad? He says, are itna bada speech hai, do galti to hoi sakta hai. So, Reet Abraham is actually up against a figure like Suresh Kalmadi to try and clean up the system. Second person, Lalit Bhanot. The 
comment that has made Lalit Bhanot immortal for all times to come and has got a million hits on YouTube is your hygiene, my hygiene, his hygiene and her hygiene. Now don't ask me what that means. What he was trying to say is that apparently the Westerners use a broom and we use a different way of cleaning the floor. Now why he said his hygiene, her hygiene, I don't know. Now how do you clean sport by getting such people out? Tell me. Um, well, uh, when I uh, finished my athletic career in 92, we had seen the likes of Suresh Kalmadi and Lalit Banat for almost 10 years. And uh, we were not scared of uh, people like them because we, we were upfront and we could say whatever we wanted. But we waited for almost 20 years thinking that uh, people like them will step down and, uh, you know, uh, people with passion will take over sports. But they didn't. And when we were competing, I think they were making money in lakhs. But uh, during the time of Commonwealth Games, we realized they were making money. In, they made money in crores. And just, uh, you know, a couple of months before the Commonwealth Games, uh, we were about 10 of us like-minded people. We said we have to do something about it because we've let this go too far. And if we don't uh, uh, want to change the system in our country, nothing is going to happen. And uh, when we launched the program on the 23rd of March, uh, three years ago, people said we were crazy, saying, how can you find goons like Suresh Kalmadi and uh, Lalit Banat? Because uh, they're going to get after you and nothing is going to change. We said, we are ready. If they want to come after us, we are ready. Because there are very few of us who can, uh, you know, tell them that what they're doing is wrong. And they laughed at us, uh, Suresh Kalmadi and Lalit Banat, saying that, how far do you think you can go to uh, stop us from, uh, you know, what we are doing? We said, we will go all out. We said it on their face. And uh, there many people said we were crazy and uh, nothing is going to change, but we were positive that we are going to make the difference. And believe me, the, now, uh, the support that we got from people and friends uh, who are passionate about sports is unbelievable. And in three years' time, I think uh, we can uh, uh, pat ourselves and with the help of the press and friends and uh, people who are, uh, you want, want to see a change in the country, uh, we have made a difference. I agree and disagree. And on that note, I'll go to Vikas. Suresh Kalmadi, yes, out. But Lalit Bhanot, unfortunately, is still the... Secretary General of the Indian Olympic Association, yes, dysfunctional, did, uh, not recognized by the inter, uh, International Olympic Committee, but he's still there. So that's a challenge that you all still need to win. But coming to, to, coming to you, Vikas, you know, when, when like-minded athletes came together to clean up Olympic sport, the BCCI is different. I mean, even today, when a Supreme Court order is against Srinivasan, if you read between the lines, the observations are there. The BCCI with 30 members are still in Chennai right now fixing the body. Tomorrow, uh, you know, he will get elected unopposed. It's been a media crusade. But what about these people? And I know you have a question because it's a Bangalore-based audience. Why don't you ask your question and tell me what the media role is? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I was uh, very happy when uh, Mr. Anil Kumble and Mr. Srinath uh, got voted to uh, the Karnataka board. And uh, one big reason why, you know, Mr. Srinivasan is going to come back is because of this weird constitution of the BCCI, which says that uh, it's the South Zone's turn to nominate the president, and therefore, the president can only be nominated by the South Zone members. And as things stand, there are, I think, six members of South Zone. And Mr. Srinivasan is tied up with all six. So he's going to be the only one nominated. So there is, he is in a minority. I mean, that's what we are led to believe whenever we talk to someone. You know, they say if it actually came to a vote, it would probably be 20 to 10 or something like that. But because of this clause, uh, he is going to get elected unopposed. And, you know, I've met Anil Kumble a couple of times. He struck me as a very sincere, very enthusiastic, very intelligent person. If I get a chance to sit across a table with him, I would love to ask him, you know, what is your compulsion? Why are you voting for Shrinivas and why are you backing him? But, uh, you know, I mean, why, why, why stop with, uh, with uh, Anil? I think uh, there, are, there are far bigger political heavyweights. I think there's Mr. Arun Jaitley. You know, there is Rajiv Shukla. There is Mr. Narendra Modi, who aspires to be the Prime Minister of the country and is going to run on good governance. You know, he's been silent about this whole thing. We've repeatedly tried to reach him for comment. He has declined to comment. Maybe, you know, he's too busy and cricket is too insignificant for him. But if that is the case, then why is he involved with the Gujarat Cricket Administration? You know, he should quit so that he can focus on politics and let somebody who knows something about the game and is passionate about run the game. 
so so when you are up against such a bunch of people and you did not mention quite a few i mean you mentioned some you have farooq abdullah jyotiraditya sindhya cp joshi i can keep going on and on what you know where does the role of the media sort of stop because it's been a media crusade every day time television radio print we've been going after these people yes we've got the supreme court yesterday backing the so called proprietorial moral stand but where do you think what, what do you think is the role of the media here you know certainly the media has a role but i wouldn't underestimate the role of uh, the everyday fan who's been out there on social media and you know i'll just give one example when uh, mr shrinivasan held that press conference the famous press conference where he said oh gurunath is just an enthusiast you know he's just a cricket enthusiast and he sort of dismissed it at that and uh, within a couple of hours twitter was sort of buzzing and you know pictures were being posted i mean people retweeted uh, tweets that gurunath had put out saying you know i'm off for the auction and you know best of luck for team chennai uh, people put up pictures of him sitting at the auction table bidding for players uh you know people dug up pictures of him with that all access pass and so on all of this was dug up by the everyday fan so you know it's not as if the media is sort of going after these people with a hatchet we are simply i think reflecting the despair and the angst of the common fan and certainly you know i think the supreme court has helped because uh, for example when the when the pro panel was set up you know the media could point out that look this is a bit of a farce and we could sort of uh, you know say that there are two judges both from tamil nadu and surely india has more states i mean surely you could you know find some other states but that was about the extent to which you could go and finally it took the supreme court to sort of throw out the whole thing and say no who, no who were you saying this to mr shrinivasan right well we sort of wrote it as well but uh, uh, unfortunately i'll stop you there and come to hakim but which mr shrinivasan are we talking about there are four mr shrinivasans four one mr shrinivasan came to the four on the day that you know that famous press conference and said gurunath is an enthusiast and he's my son in law 2nd of june 2013 second mr shrinivasan who says i will step aside because my son in law is involved so i recuse myself from the day to day functioning of the board a third mr shrinivasan was born last week in mumbai when the charge sheet was filed when he said i don't have anything to do with mr gurunath mayappan who i don't even know it's guru's problem let him sort it yesterday a fourth mr shrinivasan has been born in the supreme court you know how his lawyers pleaded that when rupa shrinivasan was dating gurunath mayappan narayan swami shrinivasan had nothing to do with it so the judge finally said but does he now know that he is his son in law so the lawyer said yes sir matter closed tomorrow we will see a fifth mr shrinivasan born you know how the press will go and say sir now that these charges are almost proved supreme court is saying this what do you have to say he said i am i am not mr shrinivasan i am his clone I, he's, he's my twin brother. Please go and ask him. The point is, Hakim, you know, against such people who are shameless, impotent, whatever you want to call them, the fact is, you know, we are banging our heads against the wall. Don't you think that frustration often times get the better of you guys as athletes when you all have suffered? I mean, me and Vikas, we'll sort of do our job as media people, but you and Reet, you've been at the receiving end of things from these people. Oh I mean there's there's absolutely no uh, debate about the fact that it is frustrating but but again like a very famous uh, video that's going viral on another note um I'll just say it's our fault you know it's our fault it's your fault if if these people are there it's because we've allowed them to be there so I'll just put it back to us I'll take it and say it's our fault for allowing them to be so powerful because um uh, again the fans memories are uh you know very short lived day after tomorrow one of these ipl teams will win the champions league and everyone's attention will get diverted i think one of the best things that the bcci has done is how they've timed certain victories to kind of you know get over all these obstacles and then divert attention big fix anyway tell so, go on. so so it comes back to us i think i think unless each of us really is committed to ensure that there's good governance across the board and i think again sport for very long has been a stepchild to the larger system so the larger system itself we were allowed that to be compromised and which of course today there's a lot of movement to mm-hmm. clean that up and i believe sport being you know for which has been a stepchild and is now slowly 
get coming into focus and the importance is being recognized, I believe we all have to stick to our guns, be more conscious of who is dictating and who is influencing, uh, w- you know, who, who is going to dictate our future for our, us, us and our children. You know, I knew he's a top management person, runs a company which is successful. I asked him a question, what happened to you? How did you suffer? He went to a completely different terrain. Don't do that. Tell me how you suffered. Did you suffer? If so, why? Name people. This is an audience that wants facts. Is corruption a way of life? Yes or no? Name how you suffered because we've got to remedy the system. Uh, frankly speaking, when we were competing, uh, it wasn't so bad because uh, we voiced whatever we wanted and uh, no, they listened to us because we performed. And uh, we thought it would remain the same and uh, you know, the generations to come, the athletes would also have a voice and uh, it would be different. But we watched for a long time and since nothing changed, we said we have to uh, you know, take charge. There is so much of corruption uh, that... Uh, there is no dirt for money. If, if you go for a sponsor, they say, uh, Reet or Ashwini, if you are uh, you know, organizing an event, we will give you money and we know that it will go to the athlete. But if there is anybody else in the uh, federation or association, we are not sure, so we don't want to give that kind of money. Uh, believe me, in Karnataka Athletic Association, uh, uh, it, Satyanarayan has been the secretary for almost 12 years. They have, an account, they have five different accounts in five different banks. And they are saying they have a deficit of 35 lakhs. And every year they are organizing events and uh, they're getting sponsors, but they say they've taken uh, hand loans from different people and, th- you know, they, they don't have any money. And even now, the athletes are going by second class unreserved. Last minute, they make reservations. Hey, and because you've got a story. And it, it's really pathetic. And, you know, the, uh, who will, who, who, which parent would want their uh, child to go, uh, you know, to compete in such uh, uh, terrible uh, circumstances? I wouldn't want my child to go, even though he or she is really, really talented. So that, that's one of the things we, we want them to change. We say, okay, we've given you all a, a chance to run the associations and federations uh, all these years. Uh, maybe 10 years back, I was not confident that I could do it. But now I can do it. I know I can do it. A much better job. And uh, my passion will, um, you know, uh, uh, draw the athletes who want to participate. And it's, it's really going to change the scenario. But they don't want to step down. If they don't want to step down, what can the media do? I, I'll, I'll paraphrase the question. Today's, today's papers, you know, I think a much more significant development was the Supreme Court. But in several papers I saw that the Champions League match between Mumbai and some Lions, whatever Lions, got featured in the top of the sports page. What is more significant for the media? Well, you know, I think if you look at the, the IPL for the last three seasons at least, uh, you know, the first season that it was held, obviously the match is sort of dominated. For the last three seasons at least, it's always been, you know, all the non-cricket. I mean, the IPL's been in the news for all the, the wrong reasons. And, you know, somebody once asked me, do you, do you want to see the IPL scrapped? And I said, good God, no. You know, for two months, it gives us front page headlines. Whatever would we do without it? So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, there is, uh, there is an enormous need to clean up things, but uh, the BCCI really resembles nothing so much as a medieval court. You know, you have a person who is in high favor one day and then the next day he's suddenly exiled. I guess we should be grateful that we haven't moved to summary executions just yet. But, you know, you, you had Mr. Jagmohan Dalmia, who was sort of the most powerful man in world cricket at one stage and then suddenly found himself a pariah, completely exiled. You've had Mr. Bindra who sort of done his stint in uh, exile and is now back, though a little, I think, uh, you know, yeah, circumscribed. I think there is, uh, you know, Mr. Lalit Modi who today is down and out, but given the way the BCI functions, you know, I wouldn't bet against him sort of coming back. He himself is convinced that a lot of his misfortunes have to do with the political dispensation. And, uh, you know, this, this uh, cycle just goes round and round. And that's really the sort of depressing part that, you know, even if uh, you do sort of get rid of one person, who's, who's next, who's going to clean up? You sort of look at the options available and you, you know, you're seriously tempted to vote none of the above. You know, we'll continue to be depressed for five more minutes and then I'll ask you all for solutions. Okay. I mean, what, what Vikas just said about the BCCI keeps going round and round. It's the same story with the International Indian Olympic Association. Suresh Kalmadi goes to jail, runs away from jail. Vikram Verma goes to jail, runs away from... So you mean to tell me that even today, think about this scenario, please, that after the Commonwealth Games mess... Lalit Bhanot was in jail for nine months, okay? Nine months. 
he comes back and he gets elected the secretary general of the Indian Olympic Association unopposed. Now, do we not have a better person than Lalit Banot? That he gets elected unopposed? What is this nonsense that is going on? And who is responsible? You will tell me the federations are responsible. Federations are cronies, perfect. The media will try and highlight. Why can't you all get candidates? Why is it? I mean, I'm saying you all because today the BCCI could not get a candidate against Srinivasan. Here, you know, the federations can't get a candidate against Lalit Banot. Why? What is the problem? Well, I, I, I'm going to continue just playing it slightly differently because I come back to that very basic thing. It's our fault. And, our, and as an athlete, I say that because today, as long as athletes continue to participate with this compromise system, it will run. Hold on. Are you trying to tell me that the athletes are also compromised and beneficiaries of the system, which is why they don't come forward? Some of them are because, and, and we've seen this across sports. Uh, and, and, and that's why corruption is never one-sided, right? If, if there is a taker, there is a giver. So unless somebody is willing to compromise, there is, uh, I mean, someone to abuse that. So my point is that unless and until all the athletes, which is a hypothetical scenario, but unless all the athletes come together and say, we will not play sport until everyone else goes, it's not going to change because as long as these guys will have athletes who are willing to bend and participate as per the way they would like things to happen, things will run. Today, it, it, you know, we don't see a lot of change because while the IOA and IOC spat continues, the respective federations remain unaffected. It's another day in the office for most of them. Their linkages with, the, with their international federations continue and until you know, uh, now, uh, some of those are jeopardized, or there's some serious impact, it's another day, another day in the office. Um, I, I, I don't agree with uh, Haki because uh, the uh, athletes or sportmen, they cannot stop participating because, you know, everybody has a short uh, uh, life. And if you say, okay, this whole year you don't take part unless you, you know, you've been uh, uh, caught for taking steroids or something and you're forced to uh, not participate for the next two years or three years, uh, if somebody has been training very hard and you tell them, okay, uh, the officials are bad and you don't take part, I, I think it's totally not fair. Now what is happening with IOA is, uh, in a way, uh, people like us are happy that uh, they have been uh, suspended and, you know, everybody's eyes is open and they know what is happening with uh, the IOA. And uh, this ban, uh, you know, has brought in so many changes and we hope that the suspension will be re revoked soon. And everybody thinks that uh, our athletes will not be able to participate. They are still participating, but unfortunately, if he or she wins a medal in the international uh, meet, uh, you know, the uh, Indian flag will not be flying and the anthem will not be playing. It's, it's just that, but, uh, uh, you know, the athlete is still competing. I'll, I'll, I'll ask a direct question. You know, he said some athletes are compromised. You know, when a body like Clean Sports India is formed, obviously it's a threat. Were you all ever offered money? No. By these people, never? Never, never. No, no, no lure, did, no compromise, no solution? Lalit, Lalit Banot and uh, Suresh Kalmadi said, what are you all doing? Why don't you all come? Let's, let's sit somewhere and discuss what is happening. He said, no, there is nothing to discuss. We are out in the open. We, we are telling you what we want. So that was it. There was no discussion. We didn't want to have any discussions with them. We just wanted them to step down. That's it. Hakim? Well, for me, uh, the thing which I was uh, wanting to you know, uh, add to... Uh, what Reed said is actually it comes up. Uh, there's a larger question: Do we do we really care about India? You know, and the, because emotionally, we all ask that question. Say, I mean, we all understand that India's flag will not fly until this mess is cleared at major international competitions, especially multi-sport events. Do these people care about India? I question that. Because when, when sort of taking off from there, I mean, Commonwealth Games, if... By the way, how many of you remember Commonwealth Games for the 101 medals that India won? And how many of you remember the Commonwealth Games for Suresh Kalmadi and Lalit Banot? Just please put your hands up for Lalit Banot and Suresh Kalmadi, please. Okay, thank you very, very much. That's why people remember the Commonwealth Games. Now tell me, yeah. when, when such a thing happens and 30,000 crores are spent yeah. of public money, right? Now, when Mr. Srinivasan is fighting this case in the Supreme Court, whose money is he spending? His father's money. 
The money is BCCI's money, which is public money. Yeah. It's their money, the fans' money. Mm. How come the BCCI, which is entangled in court cases all over the country, can keep spending that money in the name of sport when it's nothing to go, got to do with sport? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, well, like I said, the BCCI is a complex structure and certainly one of the, one of the sort of weird things about it is, is its constitution. But again, a constitution doesn't necessarily, you know, have to be carved in stone. It could be changed. But, uh, you know, equally I sort of uh, recollect what happened when uh, Mr. Ajay Makan tried to bring the BCCI within the RTI. I mean, it, it went to the cabinet. The sports bill went to the cabinet. And it found that sitting in the cabinet were, you know, various senior ministers, including Mr. Sharad Pawar and Mr. Farooq Abdullah, who sort of, you know, literally shouted him down. Uh, apparently, he was pretty close to tears by the end of it all, you know, because their whole attitude was, we are here, we've been here for a long time, you know, this upstart, who's he? Um, and, uh, you know, I've often on dealt with uh, heads of other sports associations, though I wouldn't claim to have any any the kind of expertise that either of my panelists here or Borya do. And, you know, I always sort of ask them, but, you know, why are politicians running sports associations? And they always say, because in India, to get anything done, you need a politician, otherwise it won't move. But uh, I've sort of, uh, you know, often uh, wondered why uh, we can't have, say, an alternative, uh, you know, association. If, uh, say, the, the Indian Olympic Association is suspended, surely a group of, you know, good people can sort of offer themselves and say, look, we are ready to run and in sport if required. And if need be, get some good corporates in. Uh, you know, I think uh, similarly for BCCI, I think uh, definitely the structure would need to change. I think one possibility could be maybe, you know, to uh, sort of incorporate it since there is so much public stake. Maybe it could be made a, you know, floated on the stock exchange and made a public limited company with a chairman and a CEO. And I'm, you know, I'm sure there'd be enough sports enthusiast CEOs with a clean background who would be sort of, uh, you know, interested in joining. Uh, possibly not the, the gentleman who's sort of uh, involved with the IPL franchises. I think uh, Dr. Ram Guha sort of pointed out, you know, that... Uh, the Tatas aren't part of IPL, uh, Infosys is not part of IPL, Wipro is not part of IPL. There are maybe a handful of corporates, Indian corporates, who are known for corporate governance and none of them seem to be associated with the IPL. So. There comes the first solution. But uh, before I continue with the second solution, you know, uh, Vikas makes an interesting point about why politicians in sports. Just think about this. Vijay Kumar Malhotra is 82. He's been the head of archery for the last 41 years. I dare if he can see 70 meters. You know, so KP Singh has been the president of Indian rowing for 36 years. Everybody goes 30, 25, 60, 65, and nobody wants to retire unless they die. That's the reality of Indian sport, unfortunately. Hakim, a uh, solution. Can there be a solution? Yeah, I mean, uh, without advertising too much, it, that's, that's my job. <laughs> my, what a poor job so far. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's a challenging environment in which the changes need to be made. So uh, as much as we would like to have changes overnight, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. Uh, the first thing that I, I, and the most powerful thing that I believe needs to be done is to, emp again, recognizing that it's, it's, it's our fault. Part of the solution is to empower each person with the right information that allows them to participate in sport in an educated way. So for me, one of the tools of that is information technology. Bangalore, we're sitting in Bangalore, which is one of the IT hubs. We are working on solutions that, you know, recognizing that IT can be quite a positive disruptive force. We've seen that in other sectors, and we believe that it's high time that it's integrated into sport. You can't always change the people, but we could change the way they function by putting other systems in place that make things more accountable, improve governance, and um, you know, get, make it easier to disperse information to everybody. Can you win this IOC IOA battle? Uh, yes, I think so. I'm very positive that uh, it will happen because at one point of time, IOC uh, uh, thought that uh, whatever is happening in India is not true because we have written to them umpteen number of emails and sent letters, uh, but uh, they couldn't believe it. But now, and they said the uh, Indian government was uh, interfering and, um, you know, it, it was not possible for them to do anything with the IOA. But now they truly know what ex exactly is happening in the country and you know, we were very happy with the, how IOC has handled this and, and support from the sports ministry. 
And, uh, you know, it's, it's really fantastic to uh, see that now Mr. Lalit Banot is backing up a little bit. You know, uh, I said, I publicly announced we started at 5.21, but the organizers are giving me the signal, so that's corruption as well. Uh, <laughs> but I will take it in 10 minutes because I said at 6.05 I'll go for questions, so let's not fix this one. Uh, you know, I, I will ask one more round of questions and, and, and to my panelists before I go to the audience. Quick one, before uh, I understand that they are, they are sort of running behind schedule. Because you've mentioned one solution, but I keep coming back to the role of the media. That... People like Reed, people like Hakim need to be championed. Unless they feel empowered by the media, it is actually a very challenging task to take on people like, say, you know, the, the BCCIs, the Srinivasans of the world, or the Suresh Kalmadis of the world, or whoever. Now, to what extent can the media be the public voice to champion the athletes? No, I think, look, to begin with, I think there are good things happening in Indian sport. You know, uh, our guys are starting to do better, and that's something we need to encourage. And, you know, certainly if it means cleaning up Indian sport as well, if it means asking for greater accountability, we will do it just as we would ask for it in any walk of life. You know, be it politics, be it sports, be it, for that matter, corporate governance. We will always, you know, stand for transparency and accountability with no bias, no fear and no favor. Uh, Hakim, linked to what Reeth was saying, I see a lot of difference and a lot of discord among athletes. I mean, the one athlete's body, the, I see there are 2,000 athletes' body in India. Firstly, India doesn't even matter in the larger Olympic scheme of things. But despite that, I see you guys keep fighting between each other. And that advantage is taken by these IOA guys, the administrators in power. They try and you know, play the perfect divide and rule policy that is age old, and obviously give you favor against somebody else and try and empower you to some extent so that you keep voting. Why is it that we don't have one unified athlete's body in India? Okay, first, I have no problems with Reet. No, no, I, I mean the two of you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, to answer your question, it's, it's very simple. I, uh, it's, it comes back to something I've heard multiple times. It said that uh, the British invented or uh, practiced divide and rule. And after they left, the Indians mastered it, you know. So we seem, in various walks of life, we have seem to have done it. And in sport, again, that's the case. It's by very systematic methods of favoritism, playing one against the other, that the sports bodies have been able to divide the athlete community, which is extremely unfortunate. Uh, and that's the reason why I was, I can, you know, keep coming back to that very elementary point. There needs, there is a critical need for the athletes to come together. And again, what I meant earlier where, with athletes not participating is only as a means, and, and I completely agree with Reet. I mean, for someone, if, you know, recognizing that we've been in their shoes, if we are, if we've trained for so many years to be in the position, we do not want to be compromised because of somebody else. But at the same time, it's tough. That's why I said it's an idealistic, you know, expectation. But it's a need because unless and until there, there, you know, there are, or as long as there are people who are willing to compromise, the advantages will be taken. So today, that's where the lines are. It's ruthless. Nobody cares. If I have the opportunity, and we've seen this. Last year was an extremely painful year in my sport. I mean, which I am very passionate about in swimming. It was horrible. I mean, you know, there were people who are more deserving who should have been at the Olympics. Everyone is aware of it. And someone who relatively didn't deserve to be there went. But because that person was willing to go, even though he was not in form, and was willing to call everyone else, I mean, or say bad luck to everyone else, things moved on. Today, that person, for all practical purposes, is an Olympian. And by day after tomorrow, people wouldn't even, would even forget in what circumstances that person was selected. I, I, I don't know who he's talking about, but do you know? And if so, what did Clean Sports India do about it? No, I, I don't know really. Name the person. Talking about. Well, I mean, if uh, you don't want to, at least, sort of, why didn't you all make a public outcry of it? Why didn't you all make oh, a, a huge thing of it? Why, why didn't you all get Clean Sports India involved? So, um, I, I actually put my hand up and I said, on, in my own capacity, using public uh, social media, put my hand up and said, this is absolutely not right. You've got to be blind to see that there's a problem here. But surprisingly, nobody took it up. 
and, and when we talk about the media, I got different versions. I got one version saying, oh, you know, tennis is good for publicity. You know, it's a big sport, so there was a spat between uh, all the selection issues uh, with Leanne and Mahesh. It made for good publicity. But swimming, it, it really not, not that important. You know, so we're not bothered. So the funny thing was, in the whole system, I, it was me against the rest of the world. Because everyone else was either okay with it because they were compromised in their own way or, you know, they didn't care. And it's yeah. our own issues of, that's why I say it's our fault. Wait, she's nodded her head vigorously. Go ahead. No, uh, um, okay. okay, maybe, but I wasn't. But uh, I think we could have, uh, you know, garnered more support and we could have done something, maybe like something like the tennis issue. Because there was so much of support for the uh, tennis and, and this is where we get really, really compromised. Because there's so many wheels within wheels <laughs> within our system that you, unless people with extremely high integrity are able to stand above it and say, I don't care. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I've, I, I pinged people who I knew would, should be aware of this and should participate. But it didn't happen. So for me, it's important, and that's why for me, each and every one he, present here who is listening to us, for me, I, I believe that unless they participate in the process, it will be something that we'll just talk about, and we'll not see the change. He says, participate in the process. On that note, please participate in the process. Put your hands up and ask us questions. Anyone, any of the panelists, I see quite a few hands going up already. Can we have a microphone, please, one of the volunteers? A microphone for the gentleman up here in front, blue shirt. Introduce yourself, sir, if you can. And the gentleman at the back. Sir, I'll come to you. So we can take quite a few. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. My name is Sundaram. I'm from Chennai. I'm a doctor. My question is to, uh, to everybody on the panel. The question is, in 2000, when Hansi Kronia uh, got caught, and he named three Indian players, Mohamed Azharuddin, Ajay Jadeja, and Ajay Sharma. And uh, as you see now, Mohammed Azharuddin is a member of the parliament. Ajay Chadeja is seen everywhere on Indian television. But Ajay Sharma is still banned. The question is, do we rate these three people, all criminals, on the basis of their performance? Because Ajay Sharma never got to play for India. That's why is he still banned. You want to take that? No, I think uh, Ajay Sharma, as a matter of fact, did play a few ODIs. You know, uh, <laughs> just a trivia thing. But, uh, yeah, I think Azhar sort of went to the high court and at some point of time, uh, you know, the court ruled in his favor. But uh, the fact remains that he never did play a test thereafter. He sort of got stuck on 99 tests and never got to play his 100th. And uh, I think Ajay Jadeja was a sort of, uh, you know, crying waste because he was a sort of uh, contemporary. Uh, I've played cricket with him even though only at the college level. So, uh, you know, he really should have been an India captain. And frankly, he wasn't the only sort of uh, bright talent at that stage who fell by the wayside. But I think also the, you know, the Delhi police learned a lot from that. Because if you, if you look at, uh, you know, 2013 and the way they sort of put together a charge sheet this time around, I think they made a much more compelling case and they did it a lot faster. You know, unlike that 2000 case where they were finally filing a charge sheet in 2013, this time around they got, uh, you know, uh, they got it together a lot faster. Uh, having said that, I mean, I, I, you know, you have to point out that while these uh, players are very quickly sort of strung up by the BCCI, uh, you know, more powerful individuals would have sort of gone completely untouched if the BCI had had its way. But, uh, you know, I think the police has learned better. I think, uh, you know, there is now much less tolerance towards something like fixing. Uh, I think uh, also there is much greater public outrage. Also because when it sort of happened that time, there was still, you know, a lot of people who were unwilling to believe that this could happen. And till today, I meet people who say, no, no, Azhar couldn't have done it. No way. You know, uh, so in a sense, you could say it's a loss of innocence, but equally there is far greater awareness of how the whole thing works. And, you know, there is a, a willingness to sort of take things at face value. There is also, I think, uh, players now can't have an excuse. I mean, in the 90s, you know, when, when uh, Mark Waugh and Shane Vaughan got approached by a bookie to give them tips about the weather, they could say, you know, it was just... He was just asking about the weather and that's it, you know, no big deal. And they could maybe get away with it. 
I don't think today in 2013 any cricketer could possibly get away with something like that. So in that sense, we've we've improved. Okay, the gentleman there, yes, sir. Yeah. So first of all, I would like to you know praise uh, Reet Ibrahim for his stand. He has taken again the Banaots and the Kalmadis of this country. You were talking about the solutions actually about yeah. how how we can do this. Before that, and one of the solutions actually I have suggested by Mr. Singh. But before that, I would like to tell you and actually ask you this question that the legendary Kapil Dev have started an ICL long back. Mm. And these people who are having all the muscle power with them, BCCI, mm. you know, ultimately compelled him to take it back, salute it back. And it has come to that extent, and that was the worst day of my life, when, BC, when Kapil Dev returned to the BCCI that I apologize, take me back, own me back. Can you believe this? And you are telling me that you can set this, you know, this BCCI set right. Can any athlete, by seeing this type of muscles power with this association, can stand against them? And if Reeth is doing that, actually we should applaud them. We should give Arjun prize to her. So, what's the question? I mean, so you the mean to say this, that what was the compulsion of the Kapil Dev to write to the BCCI that take me back? Okay, uh, anyone wants to take that? What was Kapil Dev's compulsion? I can, but uh, I will first ask my panelists to. And then on the same vein, what is the compulsion of Sunil Gavaskar not to speak against the BCCI? What is the compulsion of Ravi Shastri not to speak against the BCCI? One can keep going on, but all of us know what the compulsion is. You know, money speaks louder than words. 3.2 crores per year is the annual contract that the BCCI has for these people. Why should they speak? Kapil Dev is now part of the BCCI commentary panel. Why should he speak? There is a pension there out there for everybody. Why should they speak? All of us know what the story is. Reet Abraham doesn't have a 3.2 crore pension. Even if she had, she will speak. There are only very few people like that in this country who will raise their voice. That's why, sir, you are important. Please feel empowered. You and I are important. We've got to make that difference. Third question, there's a gentleman out there with his, yes sir, please. My question is related to what uh, the gentleman said. Uh, it's related to cricket. I mean, um, why don't uh, the current players, the current top players talk about uh, whatever is ha has happened? For example, it is uh, difficult to believe that Sachin Tendulkar didn't know about uh, the match fixing scandal that broke out in the 90s. Or Mahindra Singh Dori didn't know about uh, the spot fixing that is happening in the IPL. So why don't these players speak out? Uh, because these are credible players and if, if they speak out, then they will be taken seriously. So why do you think no, they don't speak out? You want to take that, Vikas? You know, like I said, the BCCI is a sort of uh, medieval court. I think, uh, you know, there are, there, are, uh, there are clean players also. But uh, I think the clean players would just sort of rather mind their own business and not, you know, sort of uh, get involved in this kind of stuff. And you know, that's not true just of players. I think that's true of uh, the larger reality of India as well, where you have a lot of good people with integrity who would rather just, you know, go about their own business and not get involved in this other quote-unquote dirty stuff. You know, though uh, I think the, the old saying does go that uh, for bad people to succeed, all that is required is for good people to remain silent. Correct. Uh, the gentleman there. Yeah. Yes. Hello, my name is Malik. Uh, my question goes to Borya, sir. Uh, uh, can you just hold the microphone up a little yeah. bit more? Uh, yeah, my correct. name is Malik. My question goes to you, sir, Borya, yeah. sir. Yeah. Uh, being a keen watcher of the game, cricket, what is expected out of a fan while after watching a match, I get to know that match was fixed or about the corrupt state of the game. So what is expected out of a fan? Should he hit the roads? Should he stop watching cricket? Uh, your point on this, sir. You see, you know, one of the worst tragedies uh, for me was uh, the IPL fixing scandal broke out on 15th of May. The final was on the 27th of May. I kept shouting my lungs hoarse on television saying, I am now pretty sure people are disgusted. Nobody will come and watch the final at the Eden Gardens. 70,000 people turned up. It was a slap on my face. So the fact of the matter is that the fan and each of us are responsible. The, all the matches post 15th of May were sold out, jam-packed. Why do you think these administrators take us for granted? They can kick us in the gut. We don't react. We are passive consumers of this spectacle. And do you mean to say you love cricket? You don't, sir. Because if you love cricket, you would have gone and watched Ranji Trophy. Two crows, one sparrow, and one, you know, God knows one sweeper is there watching Karnataka play X. When the IPL happens, you go and watch the cheer girls. So do we really love our cricket or do we consume spectacles? We Indians don't love cricket. Let us not kid ourselves. 
I, I, Other I questions? Would, uh, some, I could hear a voice. I said something. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would at this point say, <laughs> stop watching cricket for some time. Give, give importance to other sports. Yes. Uh, can we have a microphone here for the lady, please? I'll come to you. We've still got 10 minutes, so don't worry. Uh, the lady here. It's uh, not easy to stand up against the uh, establishment, and I congratulate everybody who has done it. I've done it for politics, and it's really, really difficult. My question here is, how can we all people who want to stand for good governance, good governance in every field, and since we are talking about sports, how can we support each other? We need to increase the mass who wants to do the right thing for the country, put country above self, Currently, everybody is self about country. Country can go to dogs. We are not bothered. So tell us, how can we all work together? Hakim, take that. Because you had a solution to that. Well, I mean, uh, for starters, I believe um, we need to empower. I th again, this, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, that sport has been a stepchild to the system. The system itself has flourished by asymmetric information distribution. So there have been only a few people who have certain information and that information gets exploited and abused while the rest of the population remains ignorant about what's available. For me, the single starting point is on empowering every person with information that allows them to enjoy playing sport and also understand sport to the point where they can make educated or they can participate in it at the next level. And for me, that would be one, and, and technology, like I mentioned, was one possible starting point, which we are already exploring. But there are lots of different other mechanisms which will activate and facilitate and empower each of us to, to be more than just mere spectators when things happen. Reith wants to add to that? Uh, what we are trying to do is, uh, if it is an athletic uh, association or federation in Karnataka, we're trying to get the parents and, and the kids involved and we tell them, you know, uh, these are the rights and they should stand up for what is right and what is wrong. And in a small way, you know, th that spreads because none of the parents want to send the kids to any of uh, the sports because it's so badly uh, managed and uh, they say, it's, it's really not fair that we want our kids to suffer and in some sports like tennis and swimming, the parents travel along with the kids and, you know, stay with them in hotels and some of them can afford it, but some of them can't. Some of the kids who are really, really talented and come from, you know, lower middle class families, uh, it's really sad to see that they don't, uh, you know, there is no support absolutely from them. But if all of us can get together and because all of us did sports just out of mere passion, we did not expect anything back from sport. But now a child, if he or she wants to do well, needs all the support, you know, and, and it needs... Uh, it, she or he needs to know that, okay, if, if you do well in this meet, you're going to get something and you can go forward toward the next meet. Yeah, uh, and, just, and just adding to what Reed said, but in a, just to give you a different story of sorts. This was 2000 Sydney Olympics. You had Ian Thorpe, who at the Olympic trials fell in the water and got disqualified. Now here there was somebody else who came second, I mean who eventually won that race in the qualifiers and was selected to represent Australia. Now this is, an, this is a very interesting situation because for this kid, it was the biggest thing in his life. Because, I mean, for the person who came second, because he was going to get a chance to represent the country, it was his first Olympics, biggest name, who was the world record holder going into the thing. And can you imagine the maturity that that kid required and that system required to say, I will step back because the country comes first and Ian Thorpe has the opportunity to win gold for us. Now think about it and think of your child in that scenario and would you take that particular step of saying, I will let the better man go to compete because he has a better chance. We know what happened with Indian tennis, so the answer is no. Uh, Gentlemen here, somebody had a... Yes, sir. Yep. Can we have a microphone there? Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks. And other questions? Yes, one there. There's a lot of light on... Uh, yes, yes, I got you. And there's, there's one more there, right? Okay, that's it. 
So I'll take there, these two, that one, four, yeah. Hi, my name is Samantak, and I'm also a bong. Uh, anyway, the point is, uh, my question is, uh, my question was basically targeted to Hakim, and then it opens up to the whole panel. How, this is how it goes. I mean, uh, you are basically, you basically put in that particular term called uh, the participatory power of the people, which Borea basically, you know, harped upon a bit later on. So, uh, I wanted to ask you, keeping aside the utopian terms of, let's say, integrity, empowerment, and all the other sugary words, are you probably hinting at solutions like A, having an organization where basically, which basically mirrors how we select people to the Lok Sabha, are you talking about an organization where maybe the people, the general people of the country, they come forward and uh, select the representatives? A, is that a solution that you're hinting at? Or B, like uh, Vikas said, uh, have an organization which basically talks about, you know, which basically gets corporates who are basically known for corporate governance, people who are known for their corporate uh, goodwill, you know, should they come in and use their expertise to build an efficient organization? So let's keep aside the utopian words. Let's sure. keep aside all of these what would be the very realistic immediate solution? Got it. One. Well, I mean, as much as uh, this, the latter, I mean, oh, sorry, the former option where people are empowered to select their leaders, even in sport, uh, for me, that is not going to happen anytime soon because that's not the structure that even exists beyond India. So it's not an Indian problem only. It's the way sport has been structured globally that, that India kind of adopts as well. So to now, now the latter part, which is what we want to influence. Now, the different ways. One of the ways in which we've already begun making certain impact is by benchmarking the various states and federations based on their performance. Sport, in a simple way, is measurable. Performances are measurable. And people can be held accountable for the performances at the end of the day. At the end of the day, again, like I mentioned earlier, people will clap and celebrate if a person wins a medal and may give a slight discount if there are certain other flaws. But what people will not tolerate if there's no performance and no governance. So the first thing and foremost is on how do we influence and benchmark, which is something which we've already initiated, which is already on public forum, but we, uh, clearly a lot more needs to be done to make it more, I mean, bring it more to the consciousness. I want to very quickly add to that point. You know, I think a lot more people have joined us since uh, we sort of started. So I just want to uh, re-emphasize a point I made earlier. Uh, see, you know, to a very large extent, media coverage is determined and driven by public interest. And therefore, when I say, or when Borea talks about public participation, you know, you have social media available. There is Twitter, there is Facebook. Virtually every leading media publication now will sort of have its website where it will ask for your you know, participation, vote, give your comment or whatever. So participate by all means. You know, uh, it, it sort of becomes a, a virtuous cycle, if you will, because uh, you know, when you see enough public outrage happening out there, you tend to sort of follow up on the stories and push it further, which in sort of you know, pushes up its own thing. The one thing that any person caught in the middle of a scam really, really wants is for the thing to sort of fade away from the headlines. You know, it's the classic Indian strategy. The, OK, there's an outcry today. Chalo, let's set up a probe panel. And then we'll sort of quietly wait for it to fade away. So it's as much the responsibility of the public as it is of the media to make sure that these things don't go quietly into the night. I'm sorry, I've just been shown the red flag from there. So apologies, you can ask us the questions after this panel is over. I, would, uh, I thought it was a very engrossing, interesting, and, and thanks for your participation. May I please ask you to put your hands together for Vikas Singh, Hakimuddin Habibullah, and Reet Abraham. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you very much. Uh, big thank you to our panelists. Uh, it was truly an engaging discussion. But before we leave, uh, we'd like to announce the launch of Borea Majumdar's new book called Cricketing Times. Can we please have a round of applause? Sporting Times. Also, as a memento to BLF, I'd request the panelists to please sign the whiteboard.
Also, the big fix by Vikas Singh and this book is available for signing and available for purchase backstage. So for all those who wish to read it, can go back.